Into the wild I'll go, and into the wild I am. It's been a while, freedom child, since I left my roots back home. Into the wild I'll go, and into the wild I am. It's been a while, freedom child, since I left my roots back home. Welcome to the Free Birth Society podcast. This is a radical space for women who are ready to celebrate their autonomous choices in birth, motherhood, and beyond. Together, we'll learn about wild birth through personal narrative, we'll explore the politics of birth, and we'll analyze everything that relates to our lives as women from a feminist perspective. Here's your host, Emily Saldea. It's been a wild freedom child since I've left my rules back home. Hello, women. I've got Dr. Rebecca Cohen back on the show this week in celebration of our newest collaboration. One of the most common requests that I have gotten from you all is to create a pelvic health course that covers all the problems, so to speak, of the postpartum pelvis and the pelvic floor, or bowl, as Rebecca calls it. Well, we did it. We've been working hard all fall behind the scenes to create the most info-packed, helpful, comprehensive course on the postpartum pelvis. It's called Your Postpartum Pelvis, and it is for you to aid you in your healing, to keep you healing at home outside of the medical system. Because what do we know? We know that mothers at large are having traumatic births with serious damage done to their pelvic floor with directed pushing, instruments, just trauma on top of trauma. And then women get back to the grind well before their pelvic bowl is truly healed. Women are walking around with prolapse, diastasis recti, hemorrhoids, like it's something they just need to accept about their new mother body. Rebecca was this mother, mother of nine. Her body was wrecked again and again from having babies and getting back to work, running on concrete, having no idea how to deal with this enormous disembodiment she was experiencing. Get this, she was literally scheduled for a hysterectomy when she went to a holistic pelvic health retreat and finally got the right guidance. I'm very happy to say Rebecca has kept her uterus and learned the techniques and care routines to heal her prolapse and her severe diastasis. So listen up. If you are peeing when you sneeze, healing from a tear, nervous to have sex because of the pain, avoiding the trampoline with your kids, watching your uterus fall out of your vaginal opening when you bear down to have a bowel movement, Wondering how to self-assess prolapse or diastasis, have hemorrhoids that won't go away, or just feel like something's not quite right down there. This episode and our newest course, Your Postpartum Pelvis, is crafted for you. Rebecca has now supported thousands of women over decades, helping them come back into embodiment and wholeness after childbirth using the very wisdom within this course. You deserve to feel whole again, and I am just so proud to finally have this kind of resource on the Free Birth Society platform. Go to freebirthsociety.com slash your postpartum pelvis and start healing today. All right, enjoy our conversation. All right. Welcome back to the show, Rebecca. Hey, I'm so happy to be here. Yeah, I'm glad you're here. I'm glad we're doing this a bit uh, uh, spontaneously. We are celebrating a collaboration uh, between you and I. And this is an episode to um, name that collaboration uh, and, and really to get into 
Well, uh, let me back up. I have wanted to do an episode on the postpartum pelvis for a really long time, and I haven't known who it was going to be with. And so I'm really excited that this has come into my sphere. And for any of you who are new to Rebecca, she's been on the episode before, or sorry, she's been on the show before, and you can um, find that in the show notes. We'll be sure to link it. The last episode you joined us for was around your shift from being an OBGYN into um moving into the holistic field after taking RBK. And so the previous episode was all about that journey. So it's really, it's a, it's a fan favorite. So go listen to that if you haven't. Um, But today we are going to talk about Rebecca's very personal journey with uh, her postpartum pelvis and how that paired with her just giant well of, of knowledge from working with women for so long. So we're celebrating Rebecca's course Uh, Through Free Birth Society, we're calling it Your Postpartum Pelvis and the big stuff we're going to be getting in today. So listen up if this is you or if you work with postpartum women, we're going to get into diastasis, we're going to get into prolapse, we're going to get into tearing um, and all that Rebecca has learned or a snippet of what Rebecca has learned in this arena. And then we're going to get you all jazzed up so that you can go buy this course um, because it'll change your life. This is this is must have information. Welcome. (laughs) Thanks. I'm glad to be here. So let's start with your story because you were texting me some crazy shit the other day. And that was when I was like, we got to record this. I mean, like we just said beforehand, you know, part of my intention with with bringing this onto the show is you and I both are acutely aware of how depressing and hopeless feeling women can feel after their births, particularly in these realms. You know, is my body broken? Can I heal? Am I stuck with diastasis forever? Um, Is this prolapse? What do I do? And so, yeah, this is such an important topic. and, And I'm just so glad to have you here. So why don't we start with your story of of some of what you were sharing with me privately? Yeah, thanks. So, um, Just my background, if you haven't listened to the other podcast, is I was trained as a um, more medical midwife and then went ahead to medical school. And I was trained in family medicine and then did further uh, training in obstetrics. And so I was um, also having my own children during that time. And I'm a mother of nine, but I birthed five of my children and the others came to my family through adoption. And um, my first son I had during residency and at the time. And so I think the big thing is, and what I was telling Emily is, is that for one thing, I had blocked out a lot of this, even though this was the beginning of my swing back to holistic care was to begin to figure out how to take care of myself. But my first son I had during residency, and even though I was in family medicine residency at that time, as in taking care of the family. Mm -hmm. Um, That was back before now, actually, Congress put through residency hours like that you can only work so many hours. But at that point in time, you there were no residency hour caps. So I went back four weeks to the day after having my son to these like 100 plus hour work weeks. No, And so I'm still a little bitter about it, actually, because I realized at the time, like, how difficult that was. And I just couldn't believe I was getting the support, not getting the support from my residency program. It was awful. But, you know, he was my first one. It was a 40 hour labor. I um, he was a big kid, like all of that. And I went back four weeks to the day, like back up on my feet, back up working a hundred plus hour at work weeks. So we used to do like 36 or it, it was between 34 and 36 on, and then like 12 to 14 off and then 36 on 12 off like that. And we would go through these rotations. So I, I, the, everything like the diastasis and the split that I had and, um, you know, I, I tour with that one and mm-hmm. all of that, I'm moving right along. So my second one I had following my training, I'd finished my residency, finished my post, um, my, um, fellowship training and she came super fast. She was a super fast, um, labor at home, like under two hours came out super fast And I had no clue how to take care of myself. And that felt 
great comparatively. I felt great. And I was a runner and I used to run on concrete. And within two weeks, I was out running. No. Concrete again. To Stop like, it. Yes. So the American College of Obstetrics and Gynecologists, or, you know, the quote unquote expert, the College of Obstetrics and Gynecologists. The cult, the cult of obstetrics and gynecology. Still to this day, if you look up, because I looked him up when I was re-recording this course, like, huh, what the guidelines say? They still say the same thing, which is what I was taught not only in my medical training, but in my midwifery training was, if you feel good, then return. Like, you can return. And it says, it, the quote says, if you had an uncomplicated pregnancy and normal spontaneous um vaginal delivery, you can return to exercise soon after birth. That's mm -hmm. what it says. That's all it says. That's the whole guideline. Soon after birth. It says if you had a cesarean, ask your physician first. But that's like the sum total. And so I feel like I felt good and I was out running on concrete. So then now you go to my third pregnancy. So my third pregnancy, no surprise. And actually, I do want to say after my second pregnancy and I was having like all this lower back pain and my yoga instructor said to me, and this is again within the first month of postpartum because I'm already out attending yoga classes. She oh was like, God. maybe you need to take more rest. And I remember at the time I was like, I mean, I listened to her, but I was also like, I don't, I was the quote unquote expert on, yeah, you know, I was an OB, you know, and okay. And so now my third pregnancy, it's my fourth day after pregnancy and I bear down to poop and out comes my uterus, like out comes my cervix right through, of course, because Wait, it comes your uterus or your cervix, my cervix. So my cervix, just my cervix, like poking down through my vaginal opening as I'm pooping. Right. And that kind of freaked me out. Uh, Yeah. I got back into my bed and I called my friend slash colleague who was an OB and I, and he was an older um, guy who I, you know, and I called him, you know, cause I had his cell phone. I'm like, my uterus just like came out. My cervix just came out while I was pooping. And he said, well, honey, just tuck it back up in there. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I just tucked it back up in there. Oh my God. So that was day four postpartum. Day 10 postpartum happened to be Halloween, and I was strapping my 10-plus pound baby on and trick-or-treating with my other kids. I had The point is, is I had no clue. So my fourth, same thing again, but it wasn't a big deal this time. I remember, like, bearing down, and I remember my mom came into the bathroom, and I was sitting there, and my cervix was hanging out the opening, and I was, like, pulling some memories out of it, and she was like what are you doing? And I was just like, don't worry about it, mom, go away. I got this, go away. And so that was my fourth. And then I went on to have a fifth. So that's my prolapse story in short. And so I was, well, if you can heal, anyone can. Right. So if I was pregnant, nursing, or both, for 11 years straight, right? I had those kids one after another, after another. And so here I was having prolapse, not only of my uterus, but I also had a cystocele, which is where the bladder prolapses into the vaginal vault and a rectocele where the rectum prolapses into the vaginal vault. So I had all of them. I used to, oh. I used to joke with the other OBs in my office that I worked with that my seals were barking, which was just like, I could feel my prolapse coming down. Right. Yeah. And so I went to the OB that I worked with and they recommended a hysterectomy. I was 36 years old at the time, 36, 37 years old. I went to the urogynecological surgeon that I referred people to for surgery. She told me, I went to my family practice doctor who put her arm around me and said, honey, that uterus has done so much for you. It's time to get her out, right? Yeah. yeah. And so I actually went and made, oh, so the OB that I went to, by the way, when she felt up inside she, and did an exam, she told me your sidewalls are blown. That's what she was talking about. My vaginal sidewall. She tells me your sidewalls are blown. And I believed her. I heard wow. her and I believed her. So the OB sent me to um, do pelvic floor therapy, which was not helpful. And I just ended up feeling guilty because I didn't feel like I was doing those 
right or enough or anything like that. So basically, I decided that the move for me was to have a hysterectomy and a bladder tuck. Well, you, I mean, and you barely decided it. You were told it by every single person in your life that you had any sort of mm -hmm. trust in. By two different OBs, my, the, you're a gynecological surgeon, my family practice physician. They all sort of recommended that. And so I was trying to decide timing wise, like my kids were going back to school and it would probably be better to do it after they were back to school. And then I also wanted to take this course, this holistic pelvic care course from Tammy Lynn Kent, who does holistic pelvic care. And that was sort of my weaning present was like I would be able to go to this conference and spend a week out in Portland. And so I was at that course. Oh, thank God. I know. Oh. I know. And I was trying to time it, right? And my date oh. was two weeks later. My, oh my God. That my hysterectomy was two weeks later. Wow. So I was at that course and the mind frame was such a shift and my work was such a shift. And we practiced, of course, on each other. And so one of the, um, I remember her name's Abigail Regan. She's a, a midwife and a practitioner um, in California. She was my partner. And so I confessed to her as she was doing my inner pelvic work. Well, my sidewalls are blown. Hmm. And she's like, what? She was just like, and I go, oh, my, you know, OB told me my sidewalls were blown. Hmm. And she looked me right in the eye and she said, well, that didn't serve you, did it? And I was like oh, I can let that go. Like, and by the second day, by the time I was doing the work, I really knew, I remember particular, like the exact hallway I was in on break. And I was like, number one, I'm going to start doing this work when I come back and close my conventional medical practice. I, and number two, I'm not going to have to have that surgery. Like I knew it, even though I didn't quite know which. <laughs> and so I began on a deep journey of healing there from holistic pelvic care to learning about my abdominal therapy to learning about proper women's pelvic alignment. And it was so at the time I was wearing a pessary. Do you know what the pessary pessary is like a diaphragm on steroids, like a big donut kind of that you stick up to hold your uterine organs up. Oh. I was. Still, by the way, going to the gym, lifting weights, running on concrete, I would just like pop my pessary up there, right? And so I learned how to do appropriate exercise for the female body. Um, I also had a six finger diastasis at that time. So like all of my wow. fingers plus one nobody had ever talked to me the whole time, but not only had nobody ever talked to me about that, but I, as a physician, as an obstetrician, had no clue. Right. Women used to come in and tell me that stuff, like tell me something doesn't feel right down there or something. And, and I would kind of really honestly not know what to do, you know, stick my two fingers up and feel their womb and whatever. I didn't even know, like to examine them standing up. I didn't know. And if they, if they kind of complained about it enough, I sent them to PT. But other than that, um, I had no clue what to do. And women were coming to me when I think not only about myself, but when I think about all of the medical patients totally. that were me as their physician totally. all of those years and all of the women that I saw, it's like you see them for vaginal delivery in the hospital and you see them six weeks later. And Laura looked at me and she was like, well, you didn't do that, did you? And I was so embarrassed. But mm. the answer was like, yeah. Of course yeah. you did. Yeah. Of course you did. <laughs> I have a question. Yeah. How disembodied did you feel with all of that? Like, I understand the like top layer of survival and this is just how it is. But like now you, now that you have a reference point or many reference points, like, what does that feel like? Yeah. You know, it's so, it's so interesting because like when I first learned holistic pelvic care, I had already done thousands of pelvic exams or whatever felt, you know, with this like right hand, like this, I, oh, I hate this. I hate know, this. <laughs> oh. 
<laughs> and when I switched, it was actually the first or second day, Tammy said to me, you know, as she was walking around, she said, switch to your left hand. Mm-hmm. And so suddenly I switched to like one finger with my left hand and I was feeling. And so it was totally different, like feeling the muscles, feeling the tissues, feeling the energetic layers and all of that. And so when I was first doing my own like vaginal massage and my inner pelvic work to help my organs align again, I had no clue. I had no clue like what, oh, I had checked myself in labor for dilation with my right hand fingers, right? But I had no clue other than that, like super directive, here's your ovaries, poke around. Do they feel normal? Where's the cervix in and out? Like I had no clue. And so not even on my own body, like I wasn't even much less the women's bodies that I was touching. Um, to have that sense of that. So for me, it's like this delightful coming home. It's really a coming home. And, you know, I still technically have prolapse. It's not like I have zero prolapse, but I still have my uterus. I no longer wear a a, a pessary. I no longer am thinking that I need a hysterectomy. And if I do have symptoms, then I modify what I'm doing to help with my symptoms. Kind of like if you have migraines, like if you have migraines and you get migraines all the time, which is another thing, like throughout medical school and stuff, I was having multiple migraines. And then now I have them a handful of times a year because I've learned how to take care of my body. And, um, but people, when they have migraines, they learn how to manage their migraines. And then, but there's something about prolapse, like people, when they have prolapse, it's like, oh, I am broken. And that's what I felt like. Oh, I screwed up. And I actually got super into weightlifting and powerlifting. And I was like deadlifting 200 pounds and stuff. And then, then my, surprise, my prolapse symptoms started coming back. And I even went through that all over again, like three or four years ago, where I was like, I had gotten disembodied again, Emily, honestly, I was like, Oh no. And then I was like, oh, I really broke myself this time. And I didn't. It's all fine. It's all back up there. (laughs) It's all like. And so it's a it's a continued journey with myself and conversation with myself. And truly, like this type of care that we give ourselves is honoring ourselves. It's a continuing dis um decision to honor ourselves and honor our bodies. And then it's all out there, like what we can do. And that's why I was so excited about putting this course together, because the things in the course are the things that I did like 10 years after Mm -hmm. of having prolapse, like 10 years of after having all those kids, 10 years later, Mm -hmm. these things I did 10 years later to help heal um, the prolapse. Let's get into some of that. So we had said we're going to touch on prolapse, diastasis, and tearing. Let's do tearing first. You said something kind of wild before we started recording. So, you know, my intention is to share some real helpful tips and tricks, you know, on this episode so that it can go far and wide. I really want, you know, those of you listening who have struggled with these things or are afraid of them happening. Um, just to know that that it all is so healable and repairable. And from from my lens, where I have sat in birth work, any any woman that I can think of that I've ever seen work on this with the right framework and roadmap um, with commitment has healed. You know, so you're not broken. It's not ruined. I have a hard time believing anyone needs their womb out. Um, and so, yeah, I hope you'll find some solace here and some comfort and, um, and inspiration because it does, it does take, what's the right word? Like it does take stretching out of our comfort zones to choose healing and it's vulnerable and it's scary and it's expansive. And this is such a common issue, obviously Women are blowing out their pelvic floor with traumatized, you know, fucked up, directed, pushing, numb, getting cut. Like, okay, yes, don't do that. 
you know, if you're listening to this podcast, you already know, just don't go do that. Um, but you can totally have a sovereign birth and do all the the postpartum stuff that that you referenced. So, okay, so let's take it away. Let's start with tearing. Yeah. So tearing. So you know, you and I have talked about this a lot. The the sort of the really bad tears, and I'm not willing to like never say never that that would never ever happen on a physiologic birth. But you were like, I haven't seen it. I haven't seen it yet. Like the really big bad ones, and then the other and where you might need, um, you know, some help to bring those tissues back together. So the other thing is that. I sutured everyone, like I sutured everyone all of the time. I just did. And I had my own experience. It was actually after that third to where I had an allergic uh, type reaction to the suture material. Oh, and when you were sutured. When I was sutured. Yeah. yeah. With my third child, I was sutured and I had an allergic reaction to the type of suture material she used. And so my body, um, really had this within, I can't, it was around two weeks. So somewhere like 12 days to two weeks, like the stitches were all like coming apart and my whole, you know, Yoni was red and all of that. And I ended up going in and again, having a colleague like help cut them out of me. And it kind of, and like what I know now, um, is that if I didn't, I feel like if I didn't get sutured and knew how to do proper postpartum care and lay up in bed and keep my legs together and what I understand now about the healing of the tissues, I know I would have been better off. And um, yeah, and so it's been amazing for me to witness the healing of the body rather than do sutures on everyone just because that's what I was always taught to do. When you haven't, you know, when there's um, medicalized birth and the majority of the women that I, my birthing experience have been with um, still was women with epidurals and their legs up in stirrups. And then they push that table over um, with all the instruments, you know, and I glove up and put my stuff on. And there's always suture material there and it's always open every single time. And so sometimes immediately, like the baby was born and the, and before the placenta even came out, I'd be looking cause the mom doesn't feel it. And I'd be looking and throwing stitches in to see if I could get it done real quick before the placenta even came out. Right. And so this prevalence of hearing about our mothers, our sisters, our friends who all have sutures, just because they received sutures doesn't mean they needed sutures. And I had the experience myself of having sutures um, and causing this like inflammatory reaction in my body to spit all these things out and that to really stay open. And actually, ultimately, after I had all my children, I did go in and get that repaired and I had to. I chose to get a repair later because of how bad that had been with the suture material at the time. So, yeah. Yeah. I mean, hopefully people that listen to this podcast already have those dots connected for them. Like if you're having a medicalized birth where you're laying, you're numb, you're on your back, directed pushing on drugs, da, 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 da. It is um, incredibly likely that, you are going to really, I would use the word like rip, you know, mm-hmm. not to mention that all of the medical hands that are stretching you that are inside of inside of you. I mean, it's so violent and it's so, um, and then obviously people do episiotomies and actually cut the perineum and, and then that, you know, rips as well. So we're, we really kind of have to talk about tearing in these two separate paradigms because- mm-hmm. I was going to say, because you said, oh, in a medicalized birth with an epidural on your back. I know, no, no. I had home births, though, with a more medicalized midwife who still did directed pushing. Of course. Kind of get your knees back. So you don't have to be in the hospital. It's just medicalized pushing, directed pushing, purple pushing, thinking that you even have to push rather than waiting for your body. Well, yeah. sutures are happening on a spectrum in the medical under under the purview of medical uh, providers, right? So medical midwife suture, even in a normal um, closer to the mark of a physiological birth, uh, not all medical midwives will insist on directed pushing every time, but but 
as far as I've ever tracked, almost all of them do routine suturing. And so, of course, everything exists on a spectrum, but there's two separate paradigms, you know, around around tearing versus forced, violent, you know, ripping that, like we already said, I just want to say again, um, it is my observation as well as Yolanda's, and we've both attended, you know, many births in the sovereign birth paradigm. Um, and we've also tracked thousands and thousands of birth stories, right? A and never have I ever seen a physiological tear that didn't heal. Um, does the does the yoni change? Of course, of course, yes, as as, as things do and as our bodies do, um, but actually require um, surgery to bring you know everything back together. No, I don't. I don't, I mean, of course I could be wrong. Like it might exist, but I've never seen it. Um, it. It can take way longer than you want, which opens up a different conversation. We don't necessarily have to get into, but um, you know, I had a really bad tear with my first birth and it didn't even start to feel like it was really healing in a way that I could really grasp until seven weeks. Right. Like, okay, that's actually normal, but Anyway, so suturing and tearing don't necessarily have to go together. They do go together in the medical paradigm. Um, but anyway, what else do we want to say about tearing as it relates to like postpartum healing and the postpartum pelvis? Yeah, so there's a lot of great um, tips for helping tears heal. And one of the things that I wanted to say that I think is really interesting that I hadn't come across this until I was really researching to pull some of this together for my course, but the pelvic floor muscles, you know, when I was looking at them to get the good diag diagrams and all that, I put in my, um, in my course, they are really, really well studied by physiologists. Physiologists are fascinated with the pelvic floor muscles. It's called the levator ani muscles because compared to any other muscle in the body, they have been shown to stretch without damage and repair without damage. And so they're interested in these muscle fibers and how they are. And so there was actually, I geeked out on that and went down this rabbit hole, like reading all about the muscle fibers and how they work. But how interesting that like muscle physiologists um, are. And so it's, it, for me, it was so amazing to read that. And for the stretch to come back in the studies where they've ultrasounded women's stuff and looked at all that. It's, it's eight weeks for the beginning, but really up to six months. So realize that too. But the takeaway is they have been shown to stretch further without tearing and to repair themselves without damage was the, mm -hmm. the studies used. Duh. Uh, yeah. And so, yeah. of course, like if, if any muscle in our body was going to be made to do it, it'd be that one. But there's actually sort of the research behind it to figure it out. Yeah. It's well, there's also just logic. Like a deer, <laughs> a deer is not going to walk around with some like giant irreparable tear. It just doesn't, it doesn't make sense. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, uh, the course that, that you've put out will go into quite a bit of depth around tearing. And if you find yourself with tearing in a physiological way, what to do, um, anything else you want to drop about it before we shift to diastasis? Oh, I, you know, not without, I go a lot into it in the course, yeah. Even herbs and, and, and postures and ways to take care of the, um, body and all of that. Yeah. Yeah. But I think at least for and the purpose of, yeah. Yeah. Of this episode, I want to say physiological tearing is okay. Um, it's not anything to be afraid of. It's all designed to heal. It's quite, um, it's actually quite an important part of the postpartum process, I think, to contend with the changing of, of your yoni and, and then experience the healing there's something in that for women who choose, you know, to heal and to not be sutured and to have physiological births. I found a lot of um, surprising embodiment available for me in 
realizing I can heal and that I did heal and that I could even feel better on the other side than I did before. And it just is the total counter narrative to, um, oh, thank God you had a C-section. Thank God your your pussy didn't have to go through that. Like all this disgusting, misogynistic um, mistruths. It's just not true. Yeah. Yeah. And Emily, what you just said about feeling better on the other side, I hear that in my practice Mm -hmm. with women doing holistic pelvic care with women. Um, You don't hear, but you're exactly right. You don't hear about that as much, but I have heard many, many women. um, And I love that word embodiment and the healing and how, um, yeah, they love their like yonis after. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that's, yes, women that have torn and women where it doesn't, you know, look in the mirror the same or whatever, they, they love it. And yeah, um, yeah. there's just, there's so much depth. There's so much misogynistic depth to untangle around why we think our yoni should never change, why they should look like the maiden version of us, why, you know, it's, 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 it's quite the, the rabbit hole of self-exploration. Should you choose to try it on? Um, And if you are someone who is in recovery mode from birth trauma, you know, birth violence, um, you know, needles threading your perineum, it's also healable. And I also want you to heal that, to hear that, that it, that doesn't mean there isn't any coming back. And there's a lot of cool stuff, you know, to say about it where, you know, I've been with women who, who will um, be sutured in a previous birth. And then their perineum will will reopen sometimes, not always, but will re-tear at the same point where they were sutured um, in a in a physiological birth, and then will heal it in a very real way, and it will actually become more intact. Um, there's that midwifery adage of of like I'm going to mess it up, but it's like um, you know rest in bed and the walls will find each other. Mm-hmm. Yeah, something like and that. The, it's the um, I go into this a lot in the course, the actual physiology of our pelvic floor muscles and how they overlay and they weave back and forth like a nest. Mm. And so when they find that reweaving together, it's strong. Yeah, it's really strong. Yeah, yeah, that's a great point. Yeah. OK, so diastasis. Oh, my goodness. You know, I think, like you said, it's in some ways not that big of a deal. It is so healable. Really, Mm -hmm. even if yours is jacked up, it is so healable. I have literally before my eyes watched women um, do the exercises and really commit to, again, I really just this word embodiment has been coming up so much for me lately. It's like, isn't that what this is, you know, to to choose ourselves, to choose the health of our body and to actualize the path of healing? So what, what should you say about diastasis? Yeah. So if we hit Rebecca, I'm like such the good example on all of these things because I did. So I had, you know, the kids and I never, I never ever um, thought about healing it at all. I just didn't. And I didn't, I wasn't directed to, it wasn't mentioned or any of that. And so by the time I had my, my five children, um, I had a six finger. So a six finger spread. So all five of the fingers from one hand plus another one could go in there. And I didn't even oh. really understand how to engage my core. And so oh. I just started working with some really great, um, and actually, <laughs> <laughs> who I first learned about healing diastasis with was a PT that um, I be, be, became friends with from that holistic pelvic care course, like back to that one course where she first told me about um, diaphragmatic breathing and pelvic floor breathing and abdominal breathing, like just setting the breath right and how much that that helps. And then that started the journey with that. And I I don't have one anymore. Like I don't have one and I yeah. carry one um, for 10 years. And so it's all, um, yeah, that's it. It's all healable and um, our bodies are meant to do this. Mm-hmm. And also if you are going, like the the OBs aren't going to be able to tell you, I was an OB and I wasn't able to tell you. Uh, like, obviously do not recommend <laughs> 
And so if you go to them, they're going to say surgery. Oh, my God. But I did have um, so actually a surgeon friend say that she would be willing to do like umbilical hernia and, and stitch my muscles together. No. For no, I didn't do it. But God, she, I know she's so casually. So weird. It's so, what is the word? Like sick. It's happening all, all. Oh. It's oh. happening all the time. And the other thing is that's really taken off um, is labiaplasty and plastic surgery for vaginas. It's yeah. wild how common it is. And it used to be like, oh, just big cities and porn stars. And now it's like there's multiple people that do it. And, you know, some plastic surgeons in my town. It used to be, no, I'm from Louisville, Kentucky. Plastic surgeons that are not even GYNs um, mm -hmm. in my town who do like tummy tucks and chin lifts and um, will also do labiaplasty, which is insanity. But when you asked me about my personal disconnect, like the, the disconnect in general, like from women to be that disconnected to not even understand what real yonis look like. I'm so sad. Yeah. Yeah, it is. It and is. just to hate yourself so much and yeah. to be so, yeah, I mean, you can only be disembodied if you're going to like augment yourself in that way for like the public approval or whatever, but it's, it's so, so sad broken. and it's, it's sad. It's, it's feeling broken when you're not broken and um, mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh, Yeah. Man. And, and also, you know, for women who haven't yet birthed, uh, you can prevent diastasis quite easily. You know, there isn't, none of this stuff is like a sentence, like having a baby and, and going through birth doesn't equal prolapse and diastasis and, and all of this stuff. Um, you know, I've, I've never had diastasis. I've, I've had two babies and, you know, I know that I'm nourished. I know that I rest. I know that I'm not um, self-sabotaging myself in early postpartum. I also am obviously enormously privileged to allow to have like been able to create an environment in which I can be self-healing and self-protective. You know, it's been really my highest priority since I was, uh, you know, in my 20s. So I've worked really hard to create uh, postpartums where my body can heal. You know, and, and I know that some women feel very victimized by their lives and that that's not on the table for them. Um, and I would challenge that a little bit because you don't need to pick up your 40 pound toddler on day five. You don't need to. You don't need to move your mattress. <laughs> you know, like the stories I hear, oh, yeah. like, come on, girl, just yeah. just give yourself some, some time to heal and know that you will. And and then we don't have to do all of this after the fact corrective Um you know, and you, right. It, yeah. Right. So there is, there's so much preventative stuff with how you move during pregnancy. That would be a great, another course about yeah, how, and then how um, to take care of yourself postpartum. But in my case where I didn't do any of that and just yeah. kept, like Oof. really sort of betraying my body insofar as that again and again Fertile. and again and getting the stuff in that became inflamed and made it all work like all of the things um even with all of that i am whole and healthy and yeah, yeah fit at 50 you know yeah you're not 50 are you yeah are you really <laughs> love that um <laughs> yeah yolanda has dealt with prolapse with a number of her children and it's gotten pretty dramatic and she has healed it every time and it's so cool it's mm -hmm. so cool to see that. Um, so let's talk about prolapse. So, you know, first of all, if you're two weeks postpartum, please don't diagnose yourself with prolapse. No. My friend, my darling, <laughs> just relax. It's okay. This is not for you. This is for um, someone much, much, much more postpartum there or further into their postpartum window. I mean, 
Um, because we see that, right? We see it in right. the membership. Oh, totally. We I've had people it. drive into my office and, you know, carry in their newborns in the car seat yeah. when they need to be in bed, say, worried about having prolapse. And those muscles are meant to stretch and open. And that opening stays open so that the uterus can shrink and move back right. up. And if you start like, yeah. So our point is that, yeah, actually there is, there is some physiological prolapse in the beginning, it's okay. Get back in bed. Do not, do not get in the car and go see somebody. That's, that's the opposite. It's really, I mean, do whatever you want ultimately, and just calm down. And we're really talking, when we talk about prolapse, we're talking about um, like, you know, a really chronic issue that, that did not do the physiological healing process that you are designed to do. Mm -hmm. So what do you have to say about it? Um, I have to say that the two things that help the most are probably surprising to many, but it's posture and breath and how you b breathe. And um, that's super foundational. And both of those I talk about a lot in the course because you can start to work on the gentle breath and the, the entrainment of your breath while you're laying in bed properly, mm -hmm. <laughs> ideally resting. Um, so those were the two things that were, for me, kind of the hardest What's to- What's the breath? Can you explain it? Let's do it. Yeah, it's, well, it's dia It's like diaphragmatic breathing, it's called, so that um, most of the time when we're breathing, we're only breathing up here on the mm -hmm. top of Part. And so if we actually breathe to where we're expanding the lower part, you know, our diaphragm naturally drops down and our pelvic floor diaphragm drops down in the same. And then when we exhale, then our diaphragm comes up and our pelvic floor comes up. And so there's many reasons for this, but many women will actually try to pull in their pelvic mm -hmm. floor on an inhale mm -hmm. instead. And if okay. you're just sitting there at night, you're doing it. When you're breathing at night, it's happening. So your body knows how to do it, but it's just working with um, working with that. So I have a lot of diagrams and practice and all of that. Um, and then, um, then, of course, there's pelvic floor exercises that you can learn how to do. They don't need to be done out of the out of the beginning. And sometimes if you're doing them in the beginning, you can make that worse. Mm -hmm. You can make your prolapse worse by trying to do um, pelvic yeah. contractions, aka yeah. Kegels, but I hate Kegel because that's named after Dr. Kegel and that's stupid. So we're just going to call them pelvic floor contractions. If you're trying to do them too early, it can actually make it worse or out of balance or not doing them correctly. Well, and everyone can bring it up, but like we can't like drop it down. Yeah. Right. Oh, the sneeze pee. So, mm -hmm. so that's a form, like that's an, that's a symptom of prolapse, right? It's put, sometimes, sometimes yes. And sometimes that can be a symptom of muscle weakness okay. or muscle tightness. So that's the tricky right. thing about the pelvic floor. Yeah. And prolapse, the incontinence. And I discuss all of that in the course. I discuss urinary incontinence. I also discuss fecal incontinence and like, mm -hmm. oh you know, God. not being able to hold your gas. And that shocks a lot of people. That is also normal postpartum sometimes for some women, especially women that have had like precipitous, super fast birth. Mm -hmm. And they, it gets scary because nobody talks about mm -hmm. it. And if you rest, it will heat, you know, that heals. Um, but yeah, so I talk about all of those things. But the tricky part is, is that sometimes it has to do with the pelvic floor being so tense. This is my pelvic floor and it's up like this. And I go to sneeze. It can't mm -hmm. move mm -hmm. to do it. And then sometimes it's like, it's so weak. It also can't go up to do it. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. But there's such a connection between your abdomen and your pelvic floor huge right? huge I also had no idea about that no clue like I had to learn about <laughs> abdominal muscles because that wasn't in any of my training mm -hmm. you know like yeah why would it be <laughs> we're not whole bodies we're just flawed vaginas spitting out humans <laughs> lone wow. sidings what a curve what a learning curve you've been on and just how humbling to walk with, with, you know, as you're standing in your profession to, to really wake up to how wrecked your body was and mm -hmm. then how freaking cool. I mean, you know, you're, you're such a good example because I know this to be true with so many women, but if you're just like 
not in the birth world and you just had a baby and you're feeling all messed up or it's your fourth baby, you might not know this might your mom and your sisters and your friends might all just be living with these um, problems and no one knows that it's even like you 10 years later. It is so healable. The body is always orienting towards healing and we just have to learn the roadmap. I just had a woman who consulted with me last week. She was pregnant and she said that her mom and her sisters had all told her um, that you were just good. You would never be able to jump on a trampoline again because you would lose your pee and that you would just start leaking once you had a baby. Yeah. And she came in for like a check. Like, is that right? Mm-hmm. Um, and I'm like, no, that's not right. But that's what she was being told in her family. And so she was kind of coming in beforehand, you know, looking for Mm -hmm. um, looking for help for that. And um, how many women, on the other hand, hear that? And I was like, oh, yeah, Yeah. I just leak after I have a baby. That's just what happens. Postpartum just means you'll be depressed and fucked up. It's just that's just where we're at. Yeah. Come on. So. I also just want to say about this course that if you're a birth worker, it's also like, like stupidly important that you understand all of this because you're going to be the one that women ask these kind of questions that Rebecca just, you know, referenced. You're going to be the one that helps dispel these myths. And it's, it's absolutely imperative that you have um, a clear grasp on at least the basics because this is here. Like this is, going to show up in your birth work as it has already, if you're already on the path. Um, And so, you know, Rebecca teaches this course in such a way that's like very easy to digest and you can um, add this to your toolbox. And I would really say whether it's this course or somewhere else, you need to, you need to know it. It's, it's not um, like your, your knowledge base is incomplete without this. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. All right. Well, anything else you want to wrap us up with? No, I think that's it. And I think, you know, like the very first bit, my blurb on my webpage is like, you are not broken. And I think that's the, because, and the reason it is that, and I put that right away on my webpage was because that's what women come to me. They Mm -hmm. come to me like I'm broken. And as you just heard today, I personally experienced that like, oh, I'm, I'm broken. And I need, I was just so entrenched in the medical paradigm that I thought to fix it, that I needed to have my womb out. Thank goodness. God. Thank goodness. It's heartbreaking. Yeah. Well, hopefully this episode goes far and wide and interrupts some of that patterning for some of our listeners. Yeah. Thanks. All right. Well, you can go buy it today. We are celebrating. It is called Your Postpartum Pelvis with Rebecca Cohen. Go learn and heal and tell us what you think. I hope you enjoyed the show today. You can support this podcast by donating to it on freebirthsociety.com and leaving an awesome review on whatever platform you listen on. The more reviews, the more visibility the show gets, so let's spread the word of Sovereign Birth. We've always got a lot going on at Free Birth Society, and you can find out about all of it at freebirthsociety.com, at freebirthsociety on Instagram, and opt in to my newsletter below in the show notes. We offer courses on free birth, authentic midwifery, and the blood mysteries, as well as one-on-one coaching, in-person retreats, and of course, our annual women's festival. Our exclusive vetted private membership is definitely something to check out if you're looking for a community of wise sisters. Together we rise. We must speak our stories, claim our lives, and support one another. This is the living revolution, and I am so grateful to be in it with all of you. I'll leave you with our epic Free Birth Society theme song, Wild Woman by Aruba Red. I honor you for the wisdom you held, the ancient traditions of plant medicine and womb magic. I feel the spirit of the ancestors as I place my hands upon my belly. This sacred portal will be honored. 
eons upon light beams of survival withstanding the eradication of our power by design. I will not allow the separation of our young to be forced upon me. My sisters will no longer birth in captivity. The picket line redefined from burning our wild women to paralyzing us and drugging our babes. Strapped down in a clinical white bed, drying up the milk from our breasts, keep your needles. My family will never again be doomed to chase those dragons or your poison. We reject your fear. We choose love. Everything with intention. Death, ascension. I will fly and bring her back from the stars.